أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الذي لا يبلغ مذهته القائلون ولا يسينا معه العدون ولا يودي حقه المجتهدون الذي لا يدركه بهد الهمم ولا يناله غوص الفتن الذي ليس لصفته حد محدود ولا نات موجود ولا وقت محدود ولا جل ممدود فترى الخلائق بقدرته ونشرياها برحمته ووتد بسخر ميدان عرض ثم الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وحبيبنا وحبيب رب العالمين بالقاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى أحل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين واللعن على أدائهم أجمعين من أول يوم ظلمهم إلى قيام يوم الدين أما بعد فقال الله سبحانه وتعالى في كتابه المبين وقوله الحق بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الرسول بلغ ما أنزل إليك من ربك وَإِنْ لَمْ تَفْعَلْ فَمَا بَلَّغْتَ رِسَالَتُهُ وَاللَّهُ يَحْسِمُكَ مِنَ النَّاسِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَحْدِي الْقَوْمَ الْكَافِرِينَ صَدَقَ اللَّهُ الْعَلِيَ الْعَزِيمُ Before we get started, please brothers and sisters, anyone that is listening to this lecture, please recite of Surah Fatiha for the Marhumeen of uh, tonight's sponsor. Uh, please recite of Surah Fatiha for the Marhumeen of uh, Asghar Tabatabai, and Gohranti and the Marhumeen of Sayyid Asif and Sumra Asif. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Dear brothers and sisters, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. As we're all aware, uh, tonight is the 21st night of Ramadan, and tonight is the night that Amir al Mu'minin al-Islam he left this world uh, to be with the Holy Prophet and to be with Lady Zahra. And as we're all aware, Amir al Mu'minin, we know about his uh, life, or we've heard about his life throughout our lives ourselves, and we know about his courage in the battlefield. We know about his worship in the mihrab, we know about his generosity with the poor and the destitute, we know about his character and we know about his morals. It only makes sense that the one who was raised by that personality or the one who was raised by whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself says for in Surah Al-Qalam verse number 4, وَإِنَّكَ لَالَ خُلِقَ الْعَظِيمِ and you have been created on sublime morality. It only makes sense that the one who was raised by that person who was created on sublime morality will also exhibit those same qualities, those same characters, and those same morals. You and I, we talk about each other. Why or how we know everything about us? We'll know what about us. But about Amir al Mu'minin, like I said before, we don't know much about Amir al Mu'minin in his true essence. We don't know much about his true essence. But when someone drowns in the sea, it is said that they've destroyed themselves and when they make it to shore, that they've saved themselves. But when it comes to the wilayat of Amir al-Mumin, the one who drowns in it is the one who actually saves himself and the one who makes it to shore is the one who has basically taken himself away from the wilayat and they are the ones who have truly destroyed themselves. So you and I, we can speak about Amir al-Mumin but it will never be about his true reality and his true essence. Why? Because as the Holy Prophet wasallam, he had said that, Ya Ali, no one understood you or no one understood Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala except for you and myself. No one understood me except for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you. And no one understood you except for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and myself. So according to this narration, there are only only three personalities that understood Amir al-Mu'minin 
worthy that was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who understood Amir al-Mu'mineen that was the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who understood Amir al-Mu'mineen and the third was Amir al-Mu'mineen himself who understood what he truly was when you and I we speak about Ali alayhi salam we speak of him without understanding his reality so tonight I want to speak about Imam Ali alayhi salam through the ones who did understand his reality Tonight, let's look at Amir al-Mu'minin through the eyes of the Holy Prophet, through the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and through the eyes of Amir al-Mu'minin himself. So to begin with, the verse of the Qur'an, which I started this lecture off with, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in this verse, He says, Ya ayyuh rasul, ballig ma unzila ilayka min rabbik. O Messenger, O my Messenger, proclaim the message which has been sent to you from your Lord. وَإِن لَمْ تَفْعَلْ فَمَا بَلَّقْتَ رِسَالَتُهُ وَاللَّهُ يَحْسِمُكَ مِنَ النَّاسِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَحْدِي الْقَوْمَ الْكَافِرِينَ If you do not do this, you would not have fulfilled and proclaimed His message and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will defend you from the people. For Allah does not guide those who reject faith. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not guide قوم الْكَافِرِينَ He does not guide the kafirin. Surah Al-Ma'idah verse number 67 I started this lecture off with this verse of the Qur'an and the first thing I want to do is analyze this verse of the Qur'an because this verse of the Qur'an, it lets us know a little bit about Amir al-Mu'mineen's true reality. This verse of the Qur'an was one of the last verses to be revealed to the Holy Prophet and all of the Shia Mufassireen and even Al-Wahidi, he has a narration in his Asbab al-Nuzul agreeing that this verse was revealed on the 18th of Zil Hijjah when the Holy Prophet he was returning to Medina from his last farewell pilgrimage. And what was this incident? What was the reason for the revelation of this verse? Ten years after the migration, the Holy Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he was ordered by Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala to make his pilgrimage. And he was ordered by Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala for everyone that was close to him, all of his followers to also come to this pilgrimage from different places of the Islamic nation, not just Medina, no, from all over the Islamic nation, it was ordered that the people, they should know that the Holy Prophet is making this pilgrimage now and they were to come with the Holy Prophet too. So what happens on this pilgrimage, the Holy Prophet, he taught them how to perform the pilgrimage correctly in a correct and unified manner because this after uh, after the conquest of Mecca this was the only time that the Holy Prophet had gone uh, to Hajj after the conquest of Mecca so before then people were doing Hajj but not with the Holy Prophet this was the time when the Holy Prophet went so when he went this time he taught them how to do the pilgrimage and this was the first time that the Muslims with this magnitude gathered in one place in the presence of the Holy Prophet who was their leader at that time. On his way to Mecca, the narration states that more than 70,000 70, people followed the Holy Prophet on his way to Mecca. And what happens? On the fourth day of Zil Hijjah, more than 100,000 Muslims were already in Mecca on the fourth day of Zil Hijjah. So you can imagine how many people were there by the tenth of Zil Hijjah and by the time the Holy Prophet had left. But after completing his last pilgrimage, on his return, the Holy Prophet, he stops at a place called Ghadir Qum, which was a place where people from different provinces used to greet each other before taking different routes to their uh, respective homes. And it was at this moment, it was at this juncture, it was at this place that this verse was revealed to the Holy Prophet. And he orders, when this verse was revealed, the Holy Prophet, he orders all of his companions to call back everyone that had gone forward. And he orders his companions to tell the ones that are lagging behind to come and hurry up and catch up to them. When everyone gathers, the Holy Prophet, he gives a sermon for a couple of hours in the hot sun. And he proclaims Amir al-Mu'minin Ali ibn Abi Talib al-Islam to be the Mawla after him. And I don't want to go into this sermon, inshallah, if we ever get a chance, we'll go into what that sermon truly spoke about. But what I do want to do is analyze this verse which was revealed on this occasion. And it starts off how? It starts off, O Messenger, Ya Ayyuhal Rasul. 
Ya ayyuhur rasul, O Messenger. Brothers and sisters, know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has never referred to the Holy Prophet in this tone and manner throughout the Qur'an except for this one verse. Whenever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala referred to the Holy Prophet, He would always, He would have said, Ya Asin, Taha, Ya Ayyuhal Muzammil, Ya Ayyuhal Mudastir. This is the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had always referred to the Holy Prophet. But today the tone and manner has completely changed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has referred to him as messenger. He has not said, Ya Seen Ballik, or he has not said, Taha Ballik. The job of a messenger is to convey important messages between two people. Today Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has referred to the Prophet with his job title. Why? Because the message that needs to be conveyed is of utmost importance. And when it comes to the wilayat of Amir al-Mu'minin alayhi salam, there is no Ya Asin or there is no Taha, there is just Ya Ayyuha Rasul, O Messenger. This is how important the wilayat of Amir al-Mu'minin was, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he tells the Holy Prophet, Ya Ayyuh Rasul. He doesn't say Ya Asin, the way you see in other surahs. He doesn't say Ya Ayyuh al Ya. He doesn't say any of that. But what does he say? Ya Ayyuh al Rasul. Secondly, what does Allah Subhanahu wa Taala say? He says, Ballig. Ballig. The Arabic verb is Ablig. And it's in the imperative mood. It means to convey, it means to proclaim, it means to announce. And when in used in the form of balligh, it becomes an expressive command and puts high emphasis upon the act of conveying. Nowhere in the Quran has Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put so much emphasis in his command to the Holy Prophet except on this one verse. Except in this one verse. We read so many times in the Quran the word qul. What does qul mean? Qul, it just means to say. But this is the only time where we see the word balligh. What is the, what is the significance of this? In Surah Al-Ikhlas, we read qul huwallahu ahad. Qul huwallahu ahad, what does that mean? We say that, say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one. We do not proclaim it. But when it comes to successorship, when it comes to the wilayat of Amir al-Mu'mineen, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to proclaim the wilayat, not just say it. Saying can be done privately, saying can be done openly, but proclaiming is never done privately, it is done openly for everyone to hear. Proclaiming something, a proclamation by definition, is for everyone to hear. Even in English, a proclamation is for everyone to hear. It's not for one person. It's not for you to go uh, uh, to the side and just whisper it into someone's ear. No, that's not what a proclamation is. By definition, a proclamation is for everyone to hear. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the Holy Prophet to proclaim the wilayat of Amir al-Mu'mineen, that means it's for everyone to hear. But when it comes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when it comes to Surah Al-Ikhlas, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has used the word Qul, meaning that it, when it comes to His oneness, He doesn't care if you say it privately or if you say it openly. He doesn't care if you say it to one person or He doesn't care if you say it in public. But when it comes to the mastership, when it comes to the wilayat of Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam, it must be proclaimed and said to the public, said for everyone to hear. And so how do you and I proclaim the wilayat of Amir al-Mu'mineen? It's when we say, Ashhadu anna Amir al mumineen wa Imam al muttaqeen Ali and Waliullah in the Adhan of our Salat, before we pray. It's in that Adhan. Because what is the Adhan? It's a call to prayer for everyone to hear. For everyone to hear. So it's in that call to prayer that what do we do? We proclaim the wilayat of Amir al mumin so everyone hears that. But in the next part, what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say? وَإِن لَمْ تَفْعَلْ فَمَا بَلَّقْتَ رِسَالَةً And if you do not, then you have not fulfilled and proclaimed His message. In this part of the verse, there's a severe warning to the messenger. And what is that? That if you don't convey this very message, then in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you have not conveyed His mission at all. And there are some points to look into in, in here. 
The first is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has warned the Prophet that if he doesn't proclaim the successorship of Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhis then the 23 years of hard work would go to waste. The 23 years of hard work of the Holy Prophet, it's as if he's, he's done nothing. The ones that deny the wilayat of Amir al-Mu'mineen, when the Holy Prophet's hard work of 23 years would go to waste if he did not proclaim Ali al-Islam as his successor, then what makes you believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will accept your deeds when you outright reject Imam Ali al-Islam as the true successor of the Holy Prophet? When the deeds of the Holy Prophet himself will go to waste if he doesn't proclaim this, by not proclaiming, not by not believing, but by not proclaiming. And you have people that don't believe in the wilayat of Amir al-Mu'mineen. When the Holy Prophet's 23 years of hard work will go to waste just by not proclaiming that wilayat, what makes these people think that their 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, 60 years of ibadat will be accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala while they don't, or while they reject the wilayat of Amir al-Mu'mineen The second point Risala to who, his message, the pronoun who, or the pronoun his, it goes back and refers to Rabb. So what was the Lord's message? What was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's message? You have to remember that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had sent all of the prophets to inform the people about Tawheed. If the Prophet had not proclaimed the successorship of Imam Ali Lisan, it would have been the same as not informing the people about Tawheed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us the status of the wilayat of Amir al muminin that the status of the successorship of Imam Ali Lisan is as important as Tawheed itself. If you reject one, then you become kafir. If you reject Tawheed, you've become kafir. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that, Ya Rasul, if you do not proclaim this, it's as if you haven't done anything, if you haven't proclaimed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mission at all. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mission was always, what? To bring the people within the fold of Tawheed. That was the mission of all of the Prophets. So what has Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala done? Oh well, my Prophet, if you do not proclaim this one thing, then it's as if, the mission of Tawheed, you never proclaim that mission of Tawheed itself. Let's move on. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what does he say? Wallahu yahsimuka minan nas. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will defend you from the people. We learn here the reason that the Holy Prophet had not proclaimed this message yet. This part of the verse implies that the Holy Prophet he had some anxiety and mysterious fear in announcing this message to the people. If he didn't have some fear, if he didn't have some anxiety, then why is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying, Wallahu yahsimuka minan nas, and Allah will defend you from the people. There was some fear. As we read in the beginning, O Messenger, proclaim. What is significant about this? We read in the beginning, Ya ayyuh rasul, ballig ma unzila ilayka min rabbi. We read in the beginning what? Oh my messenger, oh messenger, proclaim what had been revealed to you. The past tense has been used. So it means that the Holy Prophet, he was told this before and he withheld it out of fear of the people. Of the people, what? What the people would say about him. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He assures him that He will keep him safe against the people. He's, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala assures him that He will keep him safe against the people. And then at the end, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says what? Inna Allah la yahdi al-qawm al-kafirin. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not guide those who reject faith. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not guide the kuffar. Brothers and sisters, who is meant by qawm al-kafirin here? Keep in mind that the Sha'n and Azul or the reason for the revelation of this verse is what? The successorship to the Holy Prophet, the wilayat of Imam Ali alayhi salam. And what is the wilayat of Imam Ali alayhi salam? Surah Al-Ma'idah, verse number 55. Inna ma wa 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 hum 
only and only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is your wali and his prophet and those that keep up prayers and give zakat in the state of ruku. All of the Shias, all of the Shia Mufassirin and even Fakr din Razi, he says that this verse, this verse of Ayatul Wilayah, it was revealed in honor of Imam Ali alayhisam. The wilayat that Ali alayhisam has is the same wilayat that the Holy Prophet has, which is the same wilayat that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has. If you deny the wilayat of Ali alayhisam, you, you have denied the wilayat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And someone who denies the wilayat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, is a kafir. They become kafir. Anyone that denies the wilayat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala becomes a kafir. So when you deny the wilayat of, when Ayat al says that only and only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is your wali and his prophet and those people that gave zakat in the state of ruku, those people that keep up prayers and that gave zakat in the state of ruku, and all the mufassireen, they say that this verse was, this verse, this verse was revealed for Amir al-Mumin al-Islam. So that means what? That means that the wilayat of Imam Ali al-Islam is the same wilayat of the Holy Prophet. The wilayat of the Holy Prophet is the same wilayat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you reject the wilayat of Imam Ali al-Islam, that's rejecting the wilayat of the Holy Prophet, which is rejecting the wilayat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And anyone that rejects the wilayat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala becomes a kafir. They become a kafir. This was proving the dinars of wilayat of Amir al-Mumin kafir through the Qur'an. Through the Qur'an. For brothers and sisters, for you and I, the Qur'an is not enough. We're not from that group that says the Qur'an is enough, no. Do we have other proofs? Is there other proof? You pick up any marja Islamic laws book, and you look at who they consider to be kafir. Any marja is Islamic law book. You pick up, you pick it up, and you look at who they consider to be kafir. You will see that number one is anyone that doesn't believe in Allah Subhanahu wa Taala for his oneness. Number two, anyone that thinks any of the fourteen masumin alayhim salam to be God or God incarnate. Number two. Number three, anyone that holds enmity towards Ahlul Bayt, anyone that holds enmity towards Ahlul Bayt, and number four, anyone that does not believe in the asas or the foundation of religion. These people, our Maharajah say that these people are considered to be kafir. What was the fourth one? Anyone that does not believe in the asas, anyone that does not believe in the foundation of religion. Usul al-Kafi, volume number two. The narration is from Imam Muhammad Bakr Muhammad And what does he say? He says, Bunyal Islam al khamsa al salat was zakat was sawm wal hajj wal wilaya. Islam was created on five. The foundation of Islam are five. Prayer, zakat, fasting, hajj, and wilaya. These are the foundations of Islam. If anyone disbelieves in these, then he is a kafir. If anyone disbelieves in these, then they are a kafir. So anyone, according to Marja, if anyone disbelieves in the wilayat of the Ahlul Bayt, the wilayat of Amir al-Mu'mineen, according to them, they are kafir. Why? Because... Disbelieving in the wilayat of Imam Ali is the same as disbelieving the wilayat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why? Because their wilayat is one and the same. There's no difference in their wilayat. But after this event of Ghadir al-Hum, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He reveals which verse? He reveals to the Holy Prophet the verse of perfection of religion. What does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say? Al-yawm akmaltu lakum dinukum wa atmamtu alaykum ni'mati wa razaytu lakum islam adina. This day I have perfected your religion for you, completed my favor upon you, and have chosen for you Islam as your religion. Today I have perfected your religion for you. The perfection of religion did not occur with prayers. The perfection of religion did not occur with fasting. The perfection of religion did not occur with hajj or the giving of zakat. 
nor did it occur with the existence of the Holy Prophet who was Rahmatulil Alameen. No, the perfection of religion happened through the wilayat of Ali ibn Abi Talib That is when the religion became perfect. وَرَزَيْتُ لَكُمْ إِسْلَامَ دِينَ And I have chosen for you Islam as your religion. Because this verse was revealed after the declaration of Imam Ali as Khalifa, after the declaration of Imam Ali Islam Wilaya, the Islam that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose for us is the Islam with Ali Islam as the Khalifa, the Islam with Ali Islam as the Wali. If we follow the Islam that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has chosen for us, we are guaranteed paradise. But if we follow the Islam that was created after the Holy Prophet's demise, we aren't guaranteed anything at all. True Islam is the Islam that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has chosen. True Islam is the Islam of Wilayat Ali ibn Abi Talib al Islam. What does Imam Ali al Islam say about true Islam in itself? If true Islam is the Wilayat of Ali ibn Abi Talib al Islam, then what does Imam Ali, what does Amir al Mu'minin al Islam say about himself? Bihar al Anwar. Volume number 26, page number 1. Sermon from Amir al-Mu'minin al-Islam. Title of the sermon, Khutbatul Ma'rifatul Nuraniya. Salman Farsi and Abu Zar Ghaffari, they ask Amir al-Mu'minin about his nur. His nur. And Amir al-Mu'minin, he looks at both of his companions and he replies, Ya Salman, Ya Abu Zar, he who has only outward belief in my wilaya, but, but while inwardly having animosity will obtain no benefit from any of his deeds. Ya Salman, Ya Abu Zar, anyone, anyone who only just says I believe in the wilaya of Amir al outwardly, like some Muslims do nowadays, outwardly, but inwardly, they have animosity towards Amir al-Mumin al-Islam. He says that they will not benefit one bit from their deeds. O Salman, when, only when one recognizes me with my nur, only then will he be able to attain Iman. Only then will he be able to have faith. Only those who recognize me with my nur are the true believers. They're the true Mu'minin. O Salman, verily recognizing me as Nur is the recognition of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. My recognition is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's recognition and recognition of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's recognition of me. This is true religion. This is true religion. If we recognize Imam Ali al-Islam from his Nur, through his Nur, through his actual existence we recognize Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala recognizing Amir al-Mu'mineen is recognizing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or recognizing Amir al-Mu'mineen's nur is recognizing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Amir al-Mu'mineen he says this is true religion he goes on to say O Salman whenever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala orders to establish prayers it refers to the belief in my wilaya. One who pledges his allegiance and submits himself completely to me has truly established salat. What do we say? We recite ten times a day in our prayers. You alone do we worship and you alone do we seek help. And in Surah Al-Baqarah we read in verse 45 and seek assistance through patience and prayers. Astainu bis sabr was salat. Amir al-Mu'mineen, he says, O Salman, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said that do not seek the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala except through patience and prayers. Patience is Muhammad and prayers is my wilaya. Brothers and sisters, one thing I want to say before we carry on is that you can be as patient as you want, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not help you until what? Until you pray for help. Until you pray for help. What is Amir al-Mu'mineen saying? We read ten times a day. إِيَّاكَ نَعْبُدُ وَإِيَّاكَ نَسْتَعِينَ We only seek assistance from you. 
we only worship you and we only seek assistance from you. A majority of the Muslims, they take this verse, they say, look, these Shias, they're kafir, these Shias, they're munafir, they recite ten times a day, but then they go and they say, Ya Ali Madad. They go and they say, Ya Zahra Madad. They go and they say, Ya Abbas Madad, Ya Hussein Madad. This is kufr. This is what the other side says. This is kufr. This verse of Surah Al-Fatiha, What does it say? It just tells us to seek help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It tells us that we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the second part tells us that we seek help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But does this verse tell us how you seek help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? No, it doesn't. Surah Al-Baqarah verse number 45 tells you how to seek help. And seek assistance, seek help through patience and prayers. Seek assistance, seek help through patience and prayers. That's how we seek help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Imam Ali alayhi salam, he says what? He says, patience is Muhammad and prayers is my wilaya. So we seek help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through Muhammad and Ali alayhi salam. This isn't contradicting the Qur'an. This isn't kufr, no. This is what the Qur'an has told us to do. Imam Ali alayhi salam, he goes on to say, Zakat is the acceptance of the greatness of the attributes of the Aima alayhi salam. That's Zakat. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says that all of this is true religion, Ya Salman. Zakat, what does it, Zakat literally mean? Zakat literally means that which purifies. Something that purifies. Imam Ali is saying that it is the acceptance of the greatness of Dahl al Bayt which purifies one deed so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can accept those deeds. When you and I we accept the greatness of Dahl al Bayt and we perform something or we perform a good deed, this accepting of Dahl al Bayt as greater than us, this is what purifies our deeds. This and because of this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts these deeds. This was Amir al Mu'minin alayhi through the eyes of Amir al Mu'minin himself. This was Amir al Mu'minin alayhi through the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself. After the event of Ghadir al Qum, their Shia sources and Sunni sources or Mufassirin, they say that the first three verses of Surah Al Ma'arij. They were revealed in Medina when, after the Holy Prophet, he had come back from his last pilgrimage. Sa'ala sa'ilun bi'adhabin wa'qin. These the first verse, the second verse, and the third verse. A questioner asked about a penalty to occur upon the disbelievers, which none can repel from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Lord of the ways of ascent. These three verses. These three verses, they were revealed in Medina after the event of Ghadir Qum. The news that Ali Islam was the successor after the Holy Prophet spread to all of the urban and rural areas of Medina. And a man by the name of Haris ibn Nu'man al-Fahri, he came to know that the Holy Prophet had done this when people told everyone in Medina, this man, when he heard this, what does he do? He comes from wherever he was in, in, the, in the district of Medina to the Holy Prophet's masjid just to see the Holy Prophet. When he reached the destination, when he reached the Holy Prophet, he made his camel that he was sitting on, he made the camel sit, and he approached the Holy Prophet in the way he spoke to the Holy Prophet, because you commanded us to testify that there is no God but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and that you are the messenger of Allah, and we obeyed you. You ordered us to say the prayers five times a day, and we obeyed you. You directed us to pay the zakat, and we obeyed you. You order us to observe fast during the month of Ramadan, and we obeyed you. Then you then you commanded us to perform the Hajj to Kaaba, and we obeyed you. Look at the way this man is speaking to the Holy Prophet, or listen to the way the man is speaking to the Holy Prophet. But not just that. 
this was a companion of the Holy Prophet, according to the major, major school of thought. This man, he was a companion. If you take their definition of a companion, then this man was a companion of the Holy Prophet. What is he saying to the Holy Prophet? You, you told us to do this. You told us to pray, so we started praying. You told us that there's only one God. We believed. You told us that you're the messenger. We believed. You told us to pray. We started praying. You told us to go to Hajj. We went to Hajj. You told us to give zakat. We gave zakat. You told us to do all this. We did all this. A man who comes to the Holy Prophet and talks to him in this manner, who tells him that the only reason we're doing this is because you told us to do this. Do you think this man, Islam, had truly entered this man's heart? It's a companion of the Holy Prophet. Don't forget this. If no, someone whose heart was truly enlightened by Islam, would they come and speak to the Holy Prophet in this way? Would they come and tell the Holy Prophet the reason that we accepted all of this is because you told us to do it, that's it. And then what does he goes on to say? He goes on to say that after you told us all this, you weren't satisfied with all of this and you raised your cousin by the hand and you imposed him upon us as our master by saying that Ali is the Mola of whom I am the Mola. These were the Muslims that were living in the time of the Holy Prophet. You have all of these types of narrations, you have all of these types of incidents in the historical books, yet you want to say that all of the companions of the Holy Prophet, they were equal, they were, all, they were all on equal footing? Everyone did good? Everyone was kind? Everyone was respectful? Not just of each other, but everyone was kind, everyone was respectful for the Holy Prophet? How can you tell people to believe that when you have incidents like this, not just in Shia books, but also in Sunni books? But when he says that, you told everyone that Ali is the Mullah after you, he says, is this an imposition from you or is this an imposition from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? That's when the Holy Prophet, he says that, he swears, he says, Billah, this is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This isn't from me. This is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who told me to do this. On hearing this, this man, Harith, he turns back and he proceeds towards his camel. And while he was walking towards his camel, what did he say? He says, Ya Allah, if what Muhammad says is true, then fling on us a stone from the sky and make us suffer severe torture and punishment. He had not yet reached his camel when a stone came and struck him on his head, penetrated through his body, leaving him dead. This man was punished on the spot for asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to curse him if he really chose Ali al-Islam as the Mawla. He was cursed on the spot. And this is another verse proving that the people that reject the wilayat of Amir al-Mu'minin al-Islam their kafir. But the greater point here is that even though Rahmatul Alameen was present, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala still punished this individual. This tells us that when it comes to the ones that reject the wilayat of Amir al Mumin al Islam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not look at them with his mercy, he looks at them with his wrath. What did what happened when you completely reject the wilayat of Amir al-Mu'minin al This man, what did he basically do? By rejecting it, he belied the Holy Prophet. He made him out to be a liar. And because he made the Holy Prophet out to be a liar, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he made Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be a liar. And to test that theory, what does this genius do? He tells Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to punish him if it's true. And that's exactly what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does. He punishes who? One of the companions of the Holy Prophet. If a companion of the Holy Prophet can be punished in the lifetime of the Holy Prophet, in the lifetime of the Holy Prophet, 
What makes you think that the companion cannot be punished after, whole, after the Holy Prophet has left this world? When the companion can be punished in this world, what makes you believe that the, the companions cannot be punished in the next world to come? And this is what's amazing. The only, the only companion to have ever done everything the Holy Prophet asked him to do was Imam Ali Islam, if we look at him through the eyes of companions. Oh, but Imam Ali Islam, he was part of Dakhl al-Bayt. But if we look at him through the eyes of companions, he was the only companion of the Holy Prophet to ever do everything that was asked of him. From a young age, from the a or from the time he opened his eyes, until when? Until the time he himself, he closed his eyes. Throughout that whole time, Amir al-Mumin al he did everything the Holy Prophet had wanted him to do. And tonight, brothers and sisters, tonight is the night of the 21st of Ramadan. Tonight is the last night that Amir al-Mu'mineen is here with us. Sallallahu alayka ya Rasulallah Sallallahu alayka ya Amir al-Mu'mineen Sallallahu alayka ya Siddiqatu Fatima Sallallahu alayka ya Hassan al-Mustaba Sallallahu alayka ya Gharib al-Ghuraba Ya Aba Abdillah al-Hussein Brothers and sisters, this is the 21st of Ramazan. Imam Hassan al-Islam, he's crying. And Imam Ali Islam, he sees that his son is crying profusely and he sees that his eyes have turned completely red because of this crying. And Amir al he looks at Imam Hassan and he says, Oh my son, do not cry this much. Oh my son, please do not cry this much. And Imam Hassan al he looks at his father and he says, Oh father dear, if I don't cry tonight, then when will I cry? Oh father dear, Rasulullah left this world, then my mother left this world and now you are leaving also. Oh father dear, Whose hands are you leaving me in? Who, whose hands are you leaving me in? Imam Ali Islam, when he hears this, what does he do? He calls all of his children, and one by one, brothers and sisters, one by one, he tells them that from now on, you're in the hands of Imam Hassan. One by one, he tells them, you're in the hands of Imam Hassan. But there's one son of Amir al-Mumineen, after all of them were called, there's one son of Amir al-Mumineen who's waiting by the door to be called. And when this son wasn't called, Abu al-Fazl Abbas al he runs into the room with his mother and he says to, to his mother, Oh mother dear, when she sees him crying, she asks him, Abbas, why are you crying? And she says, and he says, Oh mother dear, Amir al-Mumineen, he called all of the children and one by one, he gave them, to, he gave them in the hands of Imam Hassan, but he never called me. Have I done anything wrong? And Umm al she goes and she goes to Amir al muminin and she says, Ya Amir al muminin can you tell me something? Have I done anything to upset you? And Amir al muminin he says, Umm al you've never done anything to upset me throughout our marriage. Then Umm al she asks, Oh Amir al muminin has my son Abbas done anything to upset you? And Amir al muminin he says, no, Mulbanin, he hasn't done anything to upset me either. Why? What has happened? She, when he says this, Umm al she says, oh, Amir al muminin you gave all of the children in the hands of Imam Hassan al-Islam, but you left Abbas and he was standing there and he came and he started crying to me and complaining. And Amir al muminin who's, he says, oh, Umm al go call my son Abbas, I want him to come right here. When Umm al calls Abu al-Fazl Abbas, 
What does he say? He says, Ummul Baneen, Ya Ummul Baneen, I married you just for the sake of this son. Ya Ummul Baneen, this son of mine, he is not to be given to Imam Hassan. This son of mine is for Imam Hussein's sake. When she goes and calls Ab Abu Fazl Abbas, Imam Amir al Mu'minin, he says, Ya Abbas, come here. When Abbas, he comes to Amir al Mu'minin, he says, Oh my son Abbas, Put your hands on the hands of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. Hazrat Abbas, he puts his hands on the hands of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. And Abul, Am Amir al mumini he says, Oh Abul Fazl Abbas, oh my son Abbas, know that I will not be there. But when this brother of yours, when this son of mine is a Musafir, when he's a traveler, then please be with him constantly. Oh Abbas, on that day when he needs me, you will be my image, you will be there on my behalf. So please, Promise me that you will always be by your, your brother Hussein. Abu Fazl Abbas Salam, he starts to cry and he says, Oh Amir, Ya Amir al -Bubineen. I will be there. I will defend my brother Hussein Salam. Brothers and sisters, what happens on the 10th of Muharram when Abu Fazl Abbas Salam, he sees that the whole army of Imam Hussein is gone. What does he do? He goes and he asks Imam Hussein Salam, permission to fight. When Imam Hussein Salam, he denies him permission he denies him permission he says oh abbas you are the standard bearer of my army ya abbas you are the leader of this army hazrat abbas he looks around and he says ya oh my master ya abba abdullah which army is there left for me to guide which army am i the standard bearer of and when Imam Hussein Salam hears this, he says, Oh my brother Abbas, please and go get some water for this caravan. The children are thirsty. When Hazrat Abbas Salam, he goes to Farah to get some water. He comes back with some water. And one of the people, one of the people of Yazid, they were hiding behind the tree. One of Abu Fazl Abbas Salam, comes. What does one of them do? They sever one of the arms of Abu Fazl Abbas Salam. He puts that mush in the other arm, the other the person. He comes and he severs the other arm. When Abu Fazl Abbas Salam, he falls to the floor. Another person, what does he do? He shoots an arrow at Abu Fazl Abbas Salam, and it hits him in the eye. Abu Fazl Abbas Salam, he gets in a state of ruku, he gets in a ruku position to try to take out that arrow with his knees. Why? Because he had no arms to take out that arrow. As soon as he got down, there was another man. He came and he struck Abu Fazl Abbas Salam on the back of the head. And that's when Abu Fazl Abbas Salam, he calls out his last salam. As-salamu alayka ya Abba Abdullah. Abu Fazl Abbas, when he says his last salam, that's when Abu Abdullah Hussein al Islam he comes to his brother and he says, Oh brother dear, now you're God, oh brother dear, now the enemies are rejoicing at what has happened to me. My back has been broken. Abu Fazl Abbas al Islam, he says, Oh my master, I ask you just to do one thing for me. Oh my master, I had been told that when I was born, the first face that I saw was your face. Oh my master, please, there's an arrow in one of my eyes and there's blood in the other eye. Can you take out the blood so I can look upon you before I leave this world? Oh my master, if I had my own two arms, I wouldn't have told you to do this, but because I don't have my arms, please, can you do this for me? Inna lillaha wa inna ilayhi raja'oon wa lanatullahi la qawmizzalimeen Ya Allah, I ask you to please keep the Imam of our time safe. Make his reappearance as soon as possible. Let us, our families, and anyone that wants to sacrifice their life for him, his cause, be able to sacrifice their life for him and his cause. Ya Allah, I ask you to please forgive our sins, to forgive the sins of our marhumin, to forgive the sins of all of our family members, I ask you, Ya Allah, to please forgive the sins of all of those marhumin, mu'minin, mu'minat that do not have anyone to pray on their behalf. Ya Allah, please forgive the sins of the marhumin of the people that sponsored tonight's majlis. Please uh, forgive the sins of the marhumin of Askar Tabatabai, the marhumin of Gohranti, the marhumin of Sayyid Asif, and the marhumin of Sudra Asif. Please forgive their sins. Ya Allah, I ask you 
the needs of the mu'mineen, whatever they are, whatever legitimate desires that they have, please fulfill all of those needs. And inshallah, brothers and sisters, uh, after 8 o'clock, inshallah, will be uh, dua, and 8.30 will be uh, marcia in Urdu, and then 9.10, inshallah, my father will have his lecture in Urdu again. Uh, please recite Surah Fatiha again for the Marhumeen of Asghar Tabatabai, for the Marhumeen of Gohranti, for the Marhumeen of Sayyid Asif, and the Marhumeen of uh, Subra Asif. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. And brother and sister, just a reminder, tonight is also a night of Shabi Qadr. And when they asked, especially Imam Jafar Sadiq which one of these, uh, which one of these nights it is, the Imam, he says, what's wrong with doing, what's wrong with doing Amal on the 21st and the 23rd? The 21st of, and the 23rd, it's between one of these nights. When they asked the Imam, uh, which one of these two nights, he says, what's wrong with doing Amal in both of these nights? Uh, it's not going to hurt you if you do it in both of these nights. But between the 19th, 21st, and 23rd, the 21st and 23rd, uh, they're accepted, or one of these days is more accepted to be the night of Shabi Qadr. So tonight also there are amals for Shabi Qadr. Uh, the same amals that were there for the 19th, uh, those amal all need to be done. Uh, and then there's some du'as, there are extra du'as that need to be recited for tonight. So uh, by all means take advantage uh, of this night, uh, there's so many people that say, you know what, we don't have time, we don't have time, we don't have time to do this. Well, in this, uh, in this virus, in this age of the virus where everyone's at home, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you time. He's given you time to pray. Now, will you take advantage of this or not? That's up to you. But if you don't take advantage of this, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you this time, then there's no reason for you to complain again, we don't have time then it just all lies on you. No, it's not that you don't have time, it's that you don't want to make time. That's the problem. So please take advantage of Laylatul Qadr, the Amal. Who, who isn't there? Is there anyone here who doesn't have any desires that they want fulfilled? No. So please, take advantage of this. If you're at home, take adva full advantage of this. If you have nowhere to go tomorrow, take full advantage of this. Stay stay awake all night and do your ibadat for this night. Walhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. And inshallah, uh, we'll continue again tomorrow, brothers and sisters. Walhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. <coughs>